Jennifer will speak to us about personal tax for foreign residents and those intending to become Australian residents. And she will also address some of the key considerations for family um, business ownership structures. Now, I know that a lot of the participants today have an international background. And so they either um, work with or advise internet, uh, clients that are foreign residents um, in Australia. So I think this topic will be of interest on, on many different levels. Um, now, Jennifer is a specialist international tax lawyer and has over 11 years experience in top tier, mid tier and boutique law firms, including EY, DLA Piper, Waterhouse Coopers in Singapore and Mills Oakley. Now, four years ago, Jennifer founded her own law firm called Evora Legal. And I hand over to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Claudia. I'll just get the presentation going here. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. Uh, as Claudia mentioned, um, I, I practice predominantly in, in international tax. I help global clients with interest in Australia and also clients who are um, looking to invest outside of Australia. So it's a it's two way traffic there as well. I'm just going to try and share my screen. It's going to cause your screen to unshare, I think, Claudia. There we go. Sorry about this. No, I think that's, I think that's what we, yep. Okay, great. And you can see that, well, we can see that the slides. Wonderful. Fantastic. Okay, great. So uh, today I wanted to take you through a, a checklist for individuals um, and for those who are, are moving to Australia. And, and just in, in terms of explaining to you the really in, in simple terms, I'm going to try and keep it quite simple, uh, the concepts of residency for both individuals and corporates and to touch on the interactions of these uh, with, with Germany. So I'll also take you through a brief case study, just a, a simple illustrative case study just to, to show you how these rules work in terms of residents, non-residents, temporary residents and, and the DTA, the double tax agreement effects of all of this. And hopefully then we'll have some time for questions. So just going through um, our, our checklist, I guess the first thing that we think about for our individuals who are moving to Australia are personal tax consequences for them, both in Australia and in Germany, of course. And the tax residence question is, is the biggest one out of all of these. And secondly, tax consequences for their businesses. So as I mentioned, a lot of my clients are are people who've got existing successful businesses overseas and, and they're looking to perhaps come to Australia to, to set up uh, the Australian operations of that. And that's what we'll do in our case study. I'll have a look at that a bit later. Uh, so that's a, that's a very common scenario that we look at. And one of the, the questions that we are often, often looking at these days as a result of some changes to legislation as well as case law is, is whether or not that's going to affect the resident status of, of their existing companies overseas which is obviously a very important issue to, for them to consider. Thirdly, the tax consequences for the families personally when they move and whether or not they're going to be setting up new structures in Australia for their business and also for their personal, their, their personal wealth holdings. And uh, I will touch briefly, but I, I will not go into any detail uh, because Angelica will be dealing with this in more detail, uh, the permanent establishment, uh, establishment risk of, of setting up these sorts of structures as well. And the fourth scenario is where our clients are staying in Australia, but, but planning to leave. So uh, I always ask my clients to give us plenty of time to plan both their arrival and their departure if they are eventually leaving again, and so that we've got uh, sufficient time to work out all of the tax implications of, of that. So just to give you a little bit of context of, of the compliance requirements associated with private groups in Australia, um, as Chloe did mention as well, uh, the ATO's got a very active tax avoidance task force, um, which was funded back in 2016 by the Commonwealth Government with, with about $680 million. Uh, so this is particularly of interest to our clients who are individuals who are resident in Australia 
uh, or become resident in Australia and who have international connections, both business and, and personal. So this task force was, was funded with, with quite a bit of money and there's been further funding extended um, to take the task force operations up to 2023. So this um, anti-avoidance task force is very active. Um, the ambit of that task force is very wide as well. And the initial, initial intention was to review private groups, uh, wealthy Australians, companies, and, and in the context of that, to look closely at promoters of, of tax avoidance schemes. So the three groups that are affected that we're looking at today um, in the private wealth program are the top 500, firstly, the top 500 private groups. So that's intended to focus on Australia's largest private groups. And that involves one-to-one -one engagement between the tax office and the taxpayers. So what they're looking at there is to do a sort of preventative uh, approach rather than a corrective approach. To, so to actually work very closely with, with the private client groups to, to work out their tax risk areas and to try and address any areas of, of concern. They've actually adopted the Justified Trust Program, which is also a, a concept from the OECD uh, in, in administering that. The second group of, of target, targeted um, uh, private individuals are the private high wealth private groups. And these are Australian resident individuals who um, together with their associates control more than $50 million worth of assets. And again, the tax office is engaging very closely with these, these groups of people. And the last group is, is the area which covers 97% of, of this high, work, high net worth uh, program. And this group is aiming to target those people who've got between five and $50 million of assets. So much lower bar and captures a lot more people. A lot, a lot of our clients are caught by this as well. Um, and it's something that's growing as well. The AATO estimates there are around 180,000 of these private groups in Australia. Uh, in, and they've recently announced new programs for these private groups in 2021. So as we heard, uh, as we know, COVID has sort of slowed down a lot of these things. Um, in my experience, a couple of matters that I've been working on have been pretty much stopped with the ATO um, saying that we're not reviewing things, we're, we're too busy administering the government stimulus package. So um, all the uh, tax offices were redeployed. Uh, so a lot of these audits and reviews are on hold, but they're going to resume in 2021, probably with a vengeance. So we have to be prepared with our clients to, to address those things. Okay, so the tax implications arising from resident status. Firstly, as a resident, in Australia, you'd be taxed on worldwide income, and I understand that's the same case in Germany, a worldwide income and capital gains, subject to any application of the double tax agreement. Uh, as a resident, you're also taxed on income that's attributed to what's called con controlled foreign companies, so companies in which Australian residents have a, a controlling interest. And in Australia, as you know, the tax rates are up to 46.5% personally. And for non-residents, they're taxed only on Australian sourced income. So they're not taxed on capital gains unless they are derived from real property, which is situated in Australia. So uh, that, that's uh, obviously a, a good position to be in when we're advising our non-resident clients who are looking to come to Australia to maintain that status for as long as they can. We also have what's called a, a temporary resident situation. So it, temporary residents are taxed like non-residents. Um, in the sense that they're only subject to tax on Australian sourced income, uh, but they can still be residents under ordinary concepts and, and for double tax agreement purposes. So moving on then to um, the comparison between these things and how you end up being resident and non-resident, how you can stay that way and what the implications are of, of each. Um, resident, non-resident and temporary resident all have obviously some, some overlapping features. The DTA tiebreaker rules are also in, in that overlapping area where a person could be a resident in, in two jurisdictions in accordance with the, the rules in that particular jurisdiction. 
and the DTA basically means uh, provides a, a regime to tie break those to say actually no that person ends up a resident of a certain jurisdiction so we can go through that as well so in terms of um, ordinary residents uh, this is a, a concept that's derived from case law and it's a, a it's called the ordinary concepts test and it basically looks at the quality and character of a person's behavior whether they intend to reside in Australia also physical presence has a is a relevant factor the family and business ties where their homes are maintained um, where their assets are located uh, one interesting uh, concept that the ATO has has uh, supported is that if if a if a non-resident is actually on a business migration visa uh, those people where their families for example move to Australia first set up set up home the kids start going to school and the non-resident is still active in their business overseas um, the tax office has said if if you're still deciding whether or not to become a resident um, we are going to regard you as as being a non-resident still so so that that is something that uh, is, is particular to a business migration sort of program but it's it's by no means the rule and the tax office obviously does reserve the right to to, to decide something different in terms of the other residence tests, so ordinary concepts is the very first thing. So once you, if you are resident under ordinary concepts, then you don't need to look at any other, any other rules. There's the concept of domicile, which I think most jurisdictions have. So a domicile of birth, of, of choice, um, uh, that will also be relevant. Um, physical presence, a lot of people think that this is the test. They think if you've been in Australia for six months of the year, then that means you're a resident. It's not necessarily the case. Obviously, the longer you're here, the, the, the more likely it is to, to cause a higher risk, but the, the tax office will look at many other factors as, as I've mentioned. So um, the DTA tiebreaker, uh, we've, we've got in the Australia, Germany D, uh, DTA, a, a tiebreaker rule where if an individual is deemed to be resident in both Australia and in Germany, um, they set out the, the steps to determine where they're ultimately resident. So the first test is if they have where they have their what's called center of vital interests. So that is basically where their family resides, their immediate family. And they talk about economic relations being closer in that center of vital interests. So that test is more a family related one, but obviously other factors can come into it. Uh, and if you can't determine that, or perhaps the person doesn't have any family, then habitual abode is the next test in the tiebreaker rules. Um, and then uh, if that, that still can't be determined because they've got a habitual abode in both Australia and in Germany, then it's based on nationality. So that's how the DTA runs through the, the rules for re relating to residency. As I mentioned, temporary residence is a, a concept that's uh, imposed by, by statute and it's something that a lot of people are taking advantage of because most people who come to Australia, whether even when they're on business migration visas, uh, family visas, any, any related visas, uh, most of them will be a temporary visa. It's very unlikely to get a permanent visa straight away. Uh, there are of course classes of visas that do that, such as global talent visas, where you are such a special person that you, you can have a permanent visa right away. But in most cases, they are temporary visas. So temporary visa holders, as I said, are. Uh, could still be residents behind that, uh, but they have the advantage of relying on these temporary resident rules to say, I'm actually, from a, from a tax perspective only, a non-resident, um, and I, I, I will only be taxed on my Australian sourced income. So temporary residents are, as I said, a temporary visa holder, and also uh, it talks about the Social Security Act as being you and your spouse aren't residents under, social, under the Social Security Act. So basically that means Australian citizens and PR holders can never be temporary residents. Uh, you must not also have been a pres uh, a, an Australian resident before in order to be a temporary resident. So uh, someone who's been in Australia before and has, has assumed residency can't then take up temporary resident status later on. So 
as I said, with COVID-19, there's been, a, a, and as Chloe's observed, a few administrative changes to the way the ATO is enforcing a lot of these rules, uh, particularly around individuals who've ended up being in Australia um, because they're stuck here and, and can't go back or there's some, some impediment to, to that. So the, the rule generally around people in that situation is if they are stuck in Australia, if they're in Australia for less than three months, the tax office doesn't care. Your employment income is, is not taxable here um, and, and they're not interested in that. But any greater than three months, and that's going to be the case for most people, because if you think about COVID-19 hitting around March, most people, if they're still stuck in Australia, would have been here for more than three months. So they, those sorts of people are going to need to consider additional tests that the tax office is going to look at to determine if their employment income is connected to Australia in any way. So the examples that they give are if, for example, you, uh, you perform work for Australian clients or you perform work for an Australian entity which is affiliated with your German employer or um, you intend actually to start making Australia your home. So all of these, again, qualitative factors um, become, become very relevant. Uh, they have said, of course, if there's no intention at all of you staying and you have no connections in Australia and you're just stuck here, um, we're not going to, to go after your employment income. And it's going to be, in the case of a German resident, still just taxable in Germany. Again, the double tax agreement will have uh, effect here. So uh, the double tax agreement uh, between Australia and Germany provides for relief from taxing employment income um, up to six for up to six months. So if, if the, the German person is in Australia working uh, the first six months of their income, if, if, if it's still being paid by their employer in Germany, will still be um, taxable just in, in Germany. Of course, this may change if there is a permanent establishment of that company in Australia. But again, um, that, that's, that's for something uh, Angelica can, can speak to you about. So a case study, just a really simple one. Um, Sam and Amy, they are German nationals and they're residents of Germany who are moving to Australia. Um, Amy intends to uh, set up an Australian uh, operations, I guess, or Asia Pacific operations of, of her family business. She owns 50% of the shares in a German company and she's also one of two directors. Okay, so they've both obtained some visas to work in Australia for up to four years. Amy's father is the other shareholder and director and he lives in Germany. So it's a very simple case study, not too complex, equal shares between Australia and, and Germany and we'll look at the implications of that. So what is their resident status and, and tax implications of that? As I mentioned, it's most likely they're going to be temporary residents and we're going to try and seek to apply that, that rule um, in which case they'll be taxable only on their Australian sourced income, their capital gains. If they do buy Australian real property and sell it, they will still be taxed in Australia. And their worldwide employment income, subject of course to the double tax agreement, which I just mentioned. Things that aren't taxable for them are foreign income. So any dividends they receive from the, the German company, if, if Amy does receive some dividends, it should not be subject to tax in Australia. Um, unless, of course, it's sourced from Australian operations or an Australian permanent establishment, which may cause additional issues. Foreign capital gains are not taxable either. And again, the employment income uh, would only be taxable if, if, if she's receiving income from the German company after, the, after six months. So what about her interests in the German company? Um, as I said, while she's a temporary resident, temporary residents are excluded from the CFC or controlled foreign company rules. So this means that uh, she is not subject to what's called attribution. And attribution is basically um, a taxation of the Australian resident on income which has accrued in the controlled foreign company of, of a certain type, which is typically passive income and is not distributed to her. So income's accruing, it hasn't come to her, but the value is increasing. She's she, she would not be taxable on that because she's uh, a temporary resident. If she receives distributions from the German companies, they're, they're likely to be sourced in Germany. Again, um, with, with 
with dividends as well, it, it is a question of, of source. And in this case, we, we can assume that the, the dividends would be sourced in Germany because there, there aren't any Australian operations at the moment to, to cause that to be different. So it's important to carefully consider the Australian corporate structure that is established, whether it's a separate legal entity, um, which can be subject to obviously separate Australian taxation or, or, the, or a branch or permanent establishment. The little twist in this is, is whether the German companies could in fact be Australian tax residents. And this is a, a something that's come up well, it happens all, it's, it's a, con, a continual issue, but it, it really has come up um, uh, in case law recently um, and has caused uh, legislation to have to be passed, which hasn't yet been passed, but an announcement has been made. So due, due to a, a, a judicial decision called Bywater Investments, foreign incorporated companies could actually become resident in Australia solely because their central management and control was in Australia. Now it's very extreme, um, but what that meant was that the traditional rule where a, a company needed to also be carrying on a business in Australia was kind of uh, changed. And, and this, this meant that um, central management and control was regarded as in fact, the act of carrying on a business, which was a little bit incorrect. Um, and that case has been in place since 2016 and is actually still, is still, the, still the, the rule. So currently we, we're still waiting for the, the government to put in place legislation, which they've announced in the budget um, to, to change that. So what they've said now is that uh, where a foreign incorporated company will only be an Australian resident where it's got a significant economic connection with Australia. So they've defined that as being core commercial activities and central management and control. So a company which is like the German company in our case, which doesn't do any, uh, hasn't yet commenced any activities in Australia. Um, and Amy is really the person who is controlling the, the company. This should not cause it to be um, uh, an Australian resident under this, this new test. But under the current situation, we may have a bit of a risk to deal with. So um, it's obviously a question of fact and degree in every case, uh, but there is that that continual that risk at the moment. The budget change announcement was that this particular test will be an opt-in from March 2017. So it's a hope that 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 will that will be the case, and it's most likely that it will be the case. So that any entities that were caught by these rules prior to now, from March 2017, can can get themselves out of it. Okay, so um, if they do decide to stay in Australia, what are the things that they need to think about when they're building their personal wealth? We ask our clients to plan, as I said, far in advance if they wish to stay in Australia. Um, and this, this is because temporary residents are deemed to acquire their assets on the date they cease being temporary residents. So that means that they obtain a cost base on that date, which is equal to the market value of the assets on that date. So adequate planning for stepping up your cost base as far as possible, if it's possible at all, is, is something that, that we often look at. Um, when Amy becomes a resident, she will also become an attributable taxpayer of the German company for CFC purposes. So there's a lot of planning that can go around that in relation to making sure that attributable income can be minimized as far as possible. Sometimes there's a need to restructure. So the types of income that would be taxable or used in the calculation to determine what she's taxed on uh, are mostly passive income streams. So things like royalties, interest, uh, rental. So to the extent that we can move those sorts of income streams away from, from that German company, then we, we would, if, if it's at all possible. So planning income streams is the first and potentially restructuring. So in terms of what structures for them personally for holding wealth, in Australia, most high net worth individuals uh, use trusts. Um, there may not be quite an equivalent concept in, in Germany, but I, when I'm referring to a discretionary trust, it means an arrangement where a person uh, holds assets on behalf of a class of beneficiaries. So 
when we're talking to our clients about trust, we, we talk about the particular specific terms that we should be drafting into each client's trust. It's not a, it's not a um, one size fits all thing, but properly drafted discretionary trust can afford some degree of asset protection compared to holding trust in your personal name. And it can afford income streaming opportunities to the extent that uh, we've got beneficiaries who are on different classes of tax rates or we have non-resident beneficiaries. Um, usually companies are also part of the structure. Um, and yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's a whole decision in relation to setting up a trust and potentially putting in place beneficiaries who are companies. There are a lot of strategies that need to be managed around those two structures, um, which, which keep tax practitioners very busy and tax accountants as well. And in terms of um, distributions, so distributions of income from an Australian trust to uh, non-tax residents are subject to tax at the trustee level. So the trustee is required to withhold tax on, on behalf of, uh, withhold and pay tax on behalf of those, those non-residents. Distri distributions of capital gains. Now foreign capital gains, as I mentioned for non-residents, if you're a non-resident, you're not taxable on foreign capital gains. Um, and unfortunately, that is not the case where those capital gains are flowing through a trust. Uh, there's been a couple of very recent federal court decisions um, by the name of Greensill and NNM Martin, which have confirmed that this is the case. Um, the, one of these cases is, is subject to appeal, but we don't know how, how, how that will go. Maybe Chloe has a view on that, uh, but it is, it is subject to, to appeal because it is, I guess, uh, the argument is that it's counter to the principle that non-residents should not be subject to tax on foreign capital gains. But the way that the legislation works is that it actually, the, the way, that's the way the legislation works. They are subject to tax and, and that's, that's actually the correct interpretation of the legislation. So it would be interesting to see what happens with those cases. So big uh, caution sign around that to make sure that if you are setting up a trust, or if it's going to acquire some assets, if they are gonna be foreign assets and you eventually want the non-residents to benefit from that, um, a, a big, big warning sign around that to make sure that you understand what the tax implications are gonna be. And in Germany, the distributions of course could be taxable. And, and as I understand, when you are setting up trusts, it could be subject to gift taxes um, and things like that. So uh, obviously cross-border planning is, is super important there. The other issues that we ask our clients to consider carefully are their estate planning. There's no inheritance tax in Australia, but there are other traps associated with structures. So um, to the extent that we've got structures in place and upon someone's death, those need to be unwound, there will be tax to pay because assets are moving around in the structures. Um, there will also be succession consequences for, for Amy in our case of inheriting the shares in a German company if she's an Australian tax resident. So she'll be a hundred percent controller in that case and, and brings with it uh, the controlled foreign company rules again, as well as some other implications. Uh, for for our, our, fa our family businesses and families who are coming to Australia, family law becomes also a relevant consideration. So couples who are coming to Australia and, and setting up often binding financial agreements are something that, that get discussed with their family lawyers in both jurisdictions, and that should tie into their tax and, and structural planning as well. Okay, so what happens when someone decides to leave Australia? Okay, so um, as I said, assuming that they are temporary residents and they haven't become Australian residents, they, they just can, they continue in, in their sort of tax treatment to be treated as non-residents. Any real property that they've got will still be subject to capital gains tax. Um, but investments that they're keeping in Australia will be, will be subject to, to tax in the normal way. Australian sourced income and gains are taxed. Um, I guess the big question for, for people who are leaving is what happens with the structures you're leaving behind? Do you want to keep them? Um, or, or would you like to wind them up if you want to keep them? Australia requires that Australian companies have an Australian resident director and for trusts, uh, the trustee needs to be a, an Australian resident, uh, an Australian tax resident uh, 
in order to, to maintain that resident status. So the change of residence of a trust is going to cause uh, a massive tax event as well. So um, that, that is actually a disposal, a capital gains tax event, which, which will give rise to significant consequences. So lots of planning required for those circumstances as well. Right, so that, that's, that's my presentation. Uh, we've been through the tax checklist for individuals, really simple, really simple um, explanation of that. And we've talked through the different tax consequences that are very high level for residents and non-residents, um, individuals and corporates. And we've discussed some planning points for new structures in Australia and, and for individuals who are wanting to set up um, their, their family wealth structures here and touched again on, on leaving Australia and what the potential implications are. So I hope that's been fast but useful and I'll invite any questions. Thank you, Jennifer, In, indeed very useful. And thank you very much for uh, breaking it down, um, especially for those of us who, who are not uh, practicing in, in taxation. Um, so that was really informative. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Now, um, um, I think we'll use this. Oh, sorry, I think someone was just saying something. Well, that might yeah, this is me. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I just <laughs> noticed one, one aspect which I come across a few times, and that is um, the capital gains tax versus uh, death duty. Um, there's no double taxation agreement. So an Australian tax resident, and I have this obviously often in this German context, a German tax resident who inherits from another German, uh, uh, Australian, sorry, an Australian tax resident inheriting from another Australian um, tax resident, German real estate will find himself or herself with the situation that she will be taxed in Germany uh, with death duty in the same time has an Australian capital gains tax event and there is no offset as it would be, for instance, in, in double taxation agreements with income. So that is a, that is something uh, you want to have to look very careful when you when you when you when you maintain property in Germany. Other other the the, the example that you had with <clears throat> with a controlling interest in a in a company has the same effect. Even a non tax tax resident would be subject to death, death duty in Germany if it's a controlling interest. So or it, doesn't, it doesn't even have to be a controlling interest. I think it doesn't have to be a substantial, which is more than 10%. Um, so, so you can find yourself in a position where you really double text uh, uh, on, the, on the same asset in, 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 uh, in, in a case of death. You know? And um, uh, when you maybe not consider yourself uh, uh, part of the German tax regime anymore, because both parties, the, the deceased and the and the beneficiary, actually are tax residents in Australia. Yeah. Mm. No, thank yes. you, Michael. That that that's absolutely very relevant. Thank you. Jennifer, I'm happy to comment on the. Um... The, the trust case, the Green Cell and Martin yes, cases, yeah. say, I think the court announced today that they're going to be um, hearing the appeal from both of those cases at the same time. Okay. Um, my personal guess, and I'm not involved in those cases, but my personal uh, prediction is that the full court will probably affirm the primary judge decisions. I agree with you that the decision doesn't seem consistent with the big picture policy that Australia is implemented in a whole bunch of other international tax rules. Um, but our courts are pretty literalist. And mm. if they find that the language of the statute can't accommodate the kind of spirit of the statute, they'll go with the language, um, as Australians know. But um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, a, thanks for that, Claudia. Yes, I think everybody's hoping for that, uh, that there will be a reconsideration of how that's, that's actually written in the legislation, but I suppose we'll have to wait till the outcome of these cases first. 
I'm just wondering, Jennifer, have you actually worked together with um, German tax professionals on any cases? How does that in practice work? Because, um, I mean, especially with the worldwide income, I assume you as the tax resident doesn't have to, to show to the ATO all your worldwide income, but rather that you discuss that with your tax advisors and they then decide what is taxable where. Have you actually uh, experienced yes. that? Yes, so I think is what you're asking, what do we disclose in, in Australia from an Australian tax resident? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it is worldwide income. So we are relying on our clients to make full disclosure to us about all their interests and assets that they have. Um, I, we work closely with, with uh, practitioners in all lots of different jurisdictions um, who've got clients who have uh, these sorts of issues. Um, so, for example, clients who have come from Germany to Australia, uh, they will basically be looking at putting together a picture of what their assets are at the time, um, making, well, we can only advise on what we were told. So we can only make sure that try and make sure that they're, they're making full disclosure to us so that we can properly advise them on, on what happens with, with those assets when they do become Australian residents. So in terms of what they would be disclosing to the tax office when they become Australian residents, um, obviously it depends on what's in the tax return, but they do need to disclose um, interest in foreign companies. They do need to disclose foreign assets. They do need to disclose loans um, from overseas. Uh, all sorts of, as, as Chloe observed, there's so many different um, rules to deal with cross-border uh, issues right now that there is a whole heap of disclosure that's required in Australia. Thank you. 